This year marks the 75th anniversary of artist Minea Kubo's illustrated memoir, Citizen 13660. Published in 1946, it was the first book-length account of America's concentration camps written by a former incarceree. Through a series of nearly 200 illustrations, each accompanied by a caption, Minea Kubo documented how World War II and the incarceration that followed upended her life. To commemorate the milestone anniversary of her iconic work, the Japanese American National Museum has organized the exhibition Minea Kubo's Masterpiece, The Art of Citizen 13660. Not only does the exhibit include 28 of the original drawings from her illustrated memoir, a second exhibition room highlights the art that inspired the 1946 book. A myriad of sketches she completed while incarcerated, a sketchbook, and a draft of the final manuscript. It is the first time this artwork and related materials have been exhibited. Kubo's interest in capturing the diversity of the incarcerated population at both Tanfran Assembly Center and Topaz resulted in several thousand quick sketches that developed into character studies, portraits, and scenes replicating daily life in the camp. These sketches created while she was incarcerated inspired drawings included in Citizen 13660. Two loose sketches show a number of incarcerees devising ways to carry cumbersome mattresses stuffed with hay back to their barracks, while other sketches show individuals sewing and women at wash tubs in a laundry room. Together, the materials in the Minea Kubo collection provide a glimpse into how Akubo witnessed and framed the telling of the World War II incarceration of Japanese and Japanese Americans. And now, for the first time, that artwork as well as the materials that detail the creative process behind Minea Kubo's masterpiece are being exhibited at the Japanese American National Museum, revealing the art of Citizen 13660. Thank you everyone for joining us today. So pleased to be able to give you a preview of Mene Okubo's masterpiece, The Art of Citizen 13660. We've been working on this exhibition. Um, it's morphed and changed over time over the last year. Um, in early 2020, we were thinking about how we would um, 
filled this gallery, there was a, a gap in the exhibition schedule, and we thought it would be important to celebrate or at least recognize the centennial of the 19th Amendment and talk about women's suffrage. But more importantly, to talk about um, the fact that Japanese immigrant women and other women in the United States were um, excluded from uh, the right to vote. And so we wanted to point that out, but also you know, underscore that they made change in other ways. But as the pandemic continued and, and Janum remained closed throughout 2020, it seemed like we needed to shift our focus a little bit. Um, there was, I think, so much interest in doing an exhibition on women. Um, and that seemed like a monumental task um, because you know, we felt we needed to, to really um, do a lot of research and spend a lot of time working on an exhibition on women and how do you choose. Um, so we entertained that idea for a little bit. Mineo Kubo was definitely one of the women we thought about highlighting. And then I will say that serendipity and collaboration have really been the through lines of this entire project. Um, two of my colleagues, so Jamie Henricks, our archivist, and Sean Iwaoka, our collection associate, were perusing the shelves one day and they stumbled across this real treasure. It was a draft of um, the Citizen 13660 manuscript in the Mine Okubo collection here at the museum, which came in in 2007 um, through the stewardship of um, Karen Higa, who was a revered um, and beloved curator here at the museum. Um, she helped to shepherd that collection in. And like most museums, um, you know, there are large collections that aren't fully processed or fully, fully cataloged or digitized. And in this case, you know, we knew about the Citizen 13660 drawings, and those are often requested by members of the public, and they're up on our website, um, but we didn't know the full extent of what we have in the collection. And so it was going to be the task of our Getty intern this summer to help us uh, determine what we had in the collection to catalog it and to digitize it. And then it became like, oh, wait a second. Citizen 13660 has a milestone anniversary this year. So 2021 is the 70, 75th anniversary of the first publishing of Citizen 13660. And so it seemed like the perfect exhibition um, for, for Janum, because uh, it allowed, would allow us to really highlight the collection. Um, so that is the focus. Um, you know, the subtitle of the exhibition is The Art of Citizen 13660. We are literally displaying the art of Citizen 13660, but we also are highlighting or underscoring um, the skill behind the creation. Um, and the collection here is amazing because um, the materials help us understand Minet's process and also um, help us understand the development of uh, the book. Um, and so that's sort of how we came to the exhibition. So I'm gonna share my screen and just show you so the exhibition opens today and it will run uh, through February 20th of 2022. So you have plenty of time to come and visit. Um, this is just an amazing sketch, I'm sorry, photograph of Minet sketching, um, something that uh, she was always described as having a pencil and sketchbook in hand. Um, and it explains just how she was able to produce so much artwork um, throughout the incarceration. Mineo Kubo is so prolific, and that's really one of the, the main points we wanted visitors to, to come away with. Um, just to give you an indication of how prolific she was, there's a, an artist profile in Trek, the literary magazine um, at Topaz, where she's interviewed about her artistic process. And she mentions that in just a few months, maybe you know, six to eight months, she'd created 1900 sketches and in a month, 50 paintings. So you know that she was incredibly prolific and we have so many of those in the collection. Um, and so again, it was our task or challenge to try to display as many of them as we could. And so we came up with these really creative ways, I think, to include more of her illustrations in the exhibition. Um, but as we were doing our research, you know, it was, we thought, okay, she was doing all these sketches in camp. And then once she left Topaz in January of 1944 and went to New York, that's when she started to think about a memoir and publishing a memoir. But we learned that actually she had created the illustrations that become Citizen 13660 while she was in camp. And we know that because the reason why she left Topaz, Fortune Magazine um, uh, gave her an offer to illustrate one of their special issues in, for the April 1944 
edition of the magazine. And so they were going to set her up with an apartment in New York. And at first she declined, but I think she saw it as potentially an opportunity for her to get her story out and also, um, you know, further her artistic practice. And by the time she got to New York, she showed um, the editors of Fortune magazine 235 illustrations, many of them became the final uh, illustrations for citizens. So we know that she was doing this while creating these while she was in camp and it's just incredible. Um, in the art, artist profile, she also talks about just needing time to work on her artwork. She needed alone time. And so, you know, this I think says a lot about her personality and work ethic, but she put up a fake quarantine sign on her barracks door and said she had hoof and mouth disease so that people would leave her alone so that she could create um, and create she did. She just produced so much uh, incredible artwork. So she just wanted to, to give you some context. Um, but, you know, as Yuka's film will probably talk about, and we, we mentioned a little bit in the exhibition, Mineo Kubo had this really burgeoning, amazing artistic career before the war. She had this really prestigious art fellowship that she received after getting an MFA at Berkeley, she was traveling all around Europe, right as war broke out in Europe. And her friends there encouraged her to come back to the US. She did. She was in the Bay Area working on a fresco with Diego Rivera and had so much promise. And World War II just really upended her entire life and her artistic practice, made her shift her focus, but she didn't stop, right? Instead, she decided that she was going to document um, her surroundings. And that's why we have this incredible body of work that says so much about the day-to-day -day experience in America's concentration camps. Um, so as visitors walk in, um, they will see um, the 1946 edition of the book. And then from there, it sort of unfolds. So this is, um, I'm sitting right in front of this case here, um, but the, the exhibition is sort of divided into two parts. The first um, is more of like an art gallery. So there are 198 um, illustrations that comprise Citizen 13660. And so it was our task to select um, a small number. So we picked 28 um, illustrations, which was very difficult um, because they're all just so amazing and so detailed. Um, but we wanted the illustrations um, to tell the narrative arc of Citizen 13660. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that uh, really struck me as we were doing research is when we were reading book reviews, um, when the, the book first came out in 1946. A lot of the reviewers felt that it was an important work that was shedding light on um, you know, this, this important topic, but felt that Manet used humor and that she was very objective and showed no bitterness. Um, and it's just, I think, amazing to hear that because when you look at the drawings, I think we see so much complexity and nuance um, and that they're not objective at all. And uh, they instead um, highlight the irony and the grief um, and the trauma, I think that um, really characterized um, the incarceration experience. So that's another thing we wanted visitors to do is to look much more closely um, at the drawings. Um, in this case here, we have items from Trek. So Trek was a literary magazine um, produced at Topaz. They produced three volumes or three editions. Um, and uh, there's some, uh, Manet was the art director um, for this literary publication. And so a lot of her artwork um, is throughout the, the issues of track, including all the covers. Um, so here's one of the illustrations up close. I think this is, it's hard to say that I have a favorite, but this is definitely one of my favorites. Um, I think you get it so immediately when you look at this, this illustration, um, but this is the moment when Manet, who you see with the, the X or cross um, pattern shirt, um, arrives at Topaz um, in Utah, um, one of the 10 uh, concentration camps in the United States. Um, and in the background, you see this welcome to Topaz sign. You see a band, um, she describes it, the Boy Scout, a Boy Scout troop from Berkeley was playing to welcome recent um, arrivals to Topaz. And then in the foreground, you see Manet and several other recent um, arrivals, and they have their, their arms up, they're shielding their faces from the inclement weather, the dust, the wind. 
And you see the irony, you know, how could such an inhospitable climate be welcoming? Um, and I think you see this um, throughout a lot of Manet's um, drawings. Um, something to point out, this is something that uh, Rose Keiko Higa, this is one of her brilliant ideas. Um, so this is an interactive. Um, one of Manet's um, contributions to Trek was this map of topaz, and it sort of gives her perspective of what topaz look like. And uh, there are a lot of landmarks that she notes, but also um, some things like mosquitoes or wind or mud or the sewer smell. Um, and as we were looking at all of the, the items on the map, we started to, um, to put it together or piece it together. And we realized that there's so many illustrations in the book that matched what's mapped um, on this topaz map. And so Rose Keiko has created um, an interactive where you can flip up these panels and see illustrations from the book um, that are also on this map. So as you go into the second gallery, we wanted to show Manet's process um, of creating Citizen 13660. And so um, this is you know, what the gallery looks like. We noticed in the collection, you know, there's so many amazing materials again that show Manet's process. This is a sketchbook. Um, and as we were looking at these sketches, we thought immediately, like, oh, there's so many illustrations that um, connect to the sketchbook. So you see some of the incarcerees again, shielding their faces from um, the harsh weather and um, conditions. There are illustrations that um, show incarcerees stuffing mattresses. That's a sketch that you see here. So many sketches of um, incarcerees waiting in line. Um, and then she also, in addition to creating hundreds of sketches of just daily life, she also kept a journal um, with these very succinct but incredibly vivid descriptions of daily life, little snapshots. So here she writes, man watching grass grow through large cracks and floor of barracks. And as we're reading this, we're like, oh, there's definitely an illustration that shows people watching grass grow. And I think it's just this commentary on just like the endless boredom um, that characterized the, the everyday. Also in the collection, so these are on the left, you see um, these sketches or character studies. Um, again, these are sketches that Manet did while she was incarcerated. And you see how they influenced um, final illustrations in Citizen. So here you see incarcerees um, with these really cumbersome mattresses and they're trying to figure out ways of getting them back to their barracks. And you see these exact figures um, in the final illustration on the right. In the foreground, you see Manet and her brother Toku. And Manet, it's interesting, she's depicted in almost every um, illustration, sometimes um, kind of off to the side, you can tell she's the narrator and sometimes um, she's in the middle of the action. We also noticed since we have the draft of the manuscript and we also have the final illustrations, we noticed some differences. Um, so here's an example of where an illustration changed. So on the left, you see Manet and her younger brother Toku um, with their, their luggage tagged with their family number, 13660. Um, and you see that the style of the, the illustration has changed in the final illustration on the right. Um, and we just thought that was interesting. And so we posed a lot of questions to allow the, the visitor to sort of um, come up with, you know, for themselves, what they think the stylistic changes mean. Does it change your perception um, of, of the situation? Um, just the way that she depicts uh, herself and her brother. Um, so that's just a very brief overview um, of the, oops, of the exhibition. I don't want to give away too much because we want you to come and visit and see the exhibition. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Rose Keiko Higa. And before I do that, I just want to say again, serendipity um, has been just characterizing this, this project. So Rose Keiko Higa is um, Karen Higa's niece. And uh, she has just been the perfect collaborator on this project. Um, um, and just the perfect person um, to work on this. And I just know that um, her aunt would be so proud of all the work that she did, the research, the writing. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Rose Keiko now.
Thank you, Kristen, for such a warm lead up. So I have had the pleasure of being Janum's Getty intern, Getty Marrow, a multicultural intern. So this is a opportunity for people with underrepresented ethnic backgrounds to get a grant to work at museums all over Los Angeles. And I had the pleasure of being hired as Kristen's intern and working on this exhibition. So like she said, a lot of what my internship was about this summer was a uh, Citizen 13660, the artwork, and helping her to work with this collection. Because when I started in June, there was a lot of it that was unprocessed. It, and for good reason. I think that the more we found out about Mine's prolific artistic ability, the more we realized that it would have taken so much time and energy emotional and physical to really work through this collection and so it was no surprise that some of these later artworks that weren't pertaining maybe as much to the japanese american incarceration experience had been left for a later date and so that later date became now when i started working and i had the opportunity to start going through this collection piece by piece and cataloging it so i've changed my virtual background to some of my my favorite pieces that I've been working with. Gosh, which way do I move my head so you can see everything? Uh, and while we found out that Mineo Kubo had produced thousands of sketches and artworks while incarcerated, it does nothing compared to her artwork post-war. Um, and so we have 85 artworks and artifacts on display in the exhibition as of right now. And there are over 500 more in our collection, not counting individual sketches. We have a lot of those sketches bundled up into categories. If, the, if we were to count those, I think it could have, it could very well be over a thousand artifacts in this collection, which makes it even more incredible that Kristen was able to work her way through everything and choose these pieces for the exhibition. Um, as of right now, I've I am the only person working at Janum currently that has seen everything in this collection. Hopefully the, the goal of this processing endeavor would be to, to make this collection accessible via documentation, digitization. We have an amazing staff at the collections department at Janum who has been, they've been working tirelessly to make sure that this collection is accessible and digitized and able to maybe have an online presence on the Janum website someday. But there, there really is a wealth of these paintings that describe Mine's post-war artwork and style and preferences that is so different from the artwork that she produced in camp. I think that we're producing work in camp really was it was a way to document and to process that experience and afterwards she was really able to embrace a lot of different styles and really become a, an artist that was not so focused on processing the trauma of a really difficult experience and so in the future hopefully you know there would be an opportunity to display some of these works that are really a lot of them are colorful and beautiful. There's a lot of the subject matter is cats and children and women. And uh, there's so much more that I could find out if I were to stay at Janum for years and years and years, but it's really, it's the collection that keeps on giving. And uh, I think that Kristen has fit in all of the amazing things about Citizen 13660, but it doesn't begin to touch on the amazing life that Mino Kubo created through her artwork um, because it would just be we would take up the entire museum and spill onto East First Street if we had tried to create that exhibition to encapsulate her entire life. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to tonight's program. Um, I want to start uh, by thanking everybody for coming to our, our discussion. I want to thank the Japanese American Memorial Pilgrimages, Pilgrimages for hosting us 
um, and Kimiko Mar, who is the master of everything. Um, tonight we have two of the incredible makers of the exhibition, um, Mini Okubo's masterpiece. I'll tell you that curation of an exhibition is never an easy task. Um, there is so much factual data and just an incredible resources of material for this exhibition that Kristen had to conceptualize and develop. And then Rose Keiko came in and was a really uh, a machine that was able to help um, Kristen with a lot of her thoughts. So um, I'd like to introduce first uh, the Director of Collections Management and Access and Curator, Kristen Hayashi, PhD. Um, and then I'd also like to introduce Rose Keiko Higa, who, as she said, was the Getty Mero multicultural intern. So I have a few questions that I'm going to be asking them, but I do encourage all of your participation. Um, if you're on YouTube, you just go ahead and type it in the live chat. Um, and it's really your opportunity to be able to speak to a real curator. Um, I think a lot of times people often ask, I mean, this is one of my first questions. A lot of times people ask like, what does it mean to be a curator? What, is it, what does a curator actually do? Um, and I think it's a, it's a really an amazing profession. So um, that's my first question to you, um, Kristen, is what does a curator do? <laughs> well, to be honest, I think I'm still trying to figure that out myself. Um, but you know, this, this collection I think was well curated um, before we even got to it, meaning that I think Mineo Kubo herself had a hand in sort of putting this together and so did Karen Higa, who was the Janum curator who helped um, to bring in the collection. The collection really was an exhibition that was like sort of in a box. And I think Rose Keiko and I just kind of refined it a little bit um, because if we did put everything in the collection out, it would be really interesting, but it would take years for our visitors to, to pour through. So I think that was our task, was to try to pick the highlights. Um, you know, the items that we thought uh, would help to best um, talk about Manet's process in creating Citizen 13660. And when it came down to picking illustrations, it was really hard because they're all so incredible on their own. But we wanted to pick, you know, illustrations that would sort of tell the narrative arc. Um, I think it's really important for the curator's voice to sort of be tempered and to sort of allow the visitor to explore the materials on their own. So we tried to keep, you know, the commentary and the, the label copy short and to pose some questions to allow visitors to sort of make their own observations and come to their own conclusions. So I think essentially that that is sort of what a curator does. Um, or at least that was our process for, for this exhibition. So Japanese American, that answer. Rose Keiko, as a, as, a, as a witness to the work that Kristen did, what do you think a curator does? Oh my gosh, well, I do think that was a very JA answer, Kristen, because in my eyes as an intern, being a curator, especially at a museum, you know, of Jam Janum's size, a, cur a curator does so much. Curator assesses a collection and has to choose from a million different things what is the most important. And Kristen did a really incredible job of taking in all of this information that we were getting about this really incredible and prolific artist. And you could say so much about her, but the curator's job is to boil it down to some of the essentials or the really important parts to stick to because there's there are all of these really magnificent little details that you could get, you know, you could fill up rooms and rooms with them, but Kristen had to choose and that's really hard. And a curator also has to choose how to show you these artifacts that we have in the collection because there are a lot of moments where you have to let the viewer make their own connections within the exhibition, but there are ways to guide them uh, subtly. And Kristen did a wonderful job of that. And that's really, I think, you know, part of what makes a really great curator is creating a show that someone can guide themselves through, but also has these suggestions of, you know, thought provoking questions that might lead the viewer to come off with a, a certain 
idea or thought about it? Very good answer. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I totally agree. You know, it, there is a, there is a reserved aspect of what, like Kristen said, letting the work speak, but, but controlling that and to, to navigate the visitor through. So yeah, no, really, both of your answers were really good. So, um, David, um, David has a question inside the chat. I don't know if you were able to see the mini Okubo show at the Skirball, Kristen. And it, it, it was, I think it was slightly similar. It wasn't exactly similar. How do you feel, one, did you see the show? And then two, how do you think it differs from your, your exhibition? I have to admit, I did not see the show at the Skirball. I have no excuse being here uh, in Los Angeles, but I do know, I think they borrowed um, some works, some of the illustrations um, from the Citizen 13660 book for the exhibition. This is before I, I started at Janum, but um, I can guarantee that so much of what we have in our exhibition um, was not in, in the Skirball show because again, a lot of this was uncatalogued and we didn't know that um, so many of the, the sketches or even the draft manuscript for Citizen 13660 was in the collection um, you know, a few months ago. So uh, it's all new, a lot of it is, is material that's never been um, displayed before. And so these are all the materials um, that sort of help illustrate the process from quick sketch to final illustration for Citizen 13660. So that's how it differs. Yeah, and again, we wanted to, to sort of you know, showcase um, Mineo Kubo's work in sort of like a gallery setting and then um, to sort of, you know, underscore this was her masterpiece. And then the second gallery is more about the behind the scenes to um, the skill behind creating the manuscript for the book. Yeah, I, I would I would second what Kristen said. I feel like the the archive that Kristen put on display, if you come to see the show, you will be I will I will say blown away by just the depth of this of this archive. So definitely, and and it's not a lot. It's not a lot of re recreations. It's, you're seeing the real thing. So it's it's amazing. You can almost feel the artist's hand in the exhibition. Um, so um, Kristen, with so many, you know, Mini Okubo was is not alive, obviously. Um, and so, you know, it is a lot of research, but it's also a, it's also a larger question that you are dealing with currently with a lot of our elders passing on, a lot of the Nisei leaving and so many of the Sansei as well. Um, how do you think the, your research is going to continue? Like, how, what were some of the research things that you had to do for this show? Um, you know, and, and how do you think it's going to um, continue on in the future? how you develop these exhibitions and stories? Yeah, um, well, again, um, we drew a lot of our, our research from the archive itself, but um, uh, you'll have to come see the exhibition and see Yuka Murakami's um, film, which I think gives an overall or more comprehensive view of Mineo Kubo's career from before the war uh, to her post-war work, but I think that film is really important, not only because it shows her career more comprehensively, but it includes interviews with um, some of Mineo Kubo's nieces, um, and, as well as um, some friends and scholars who did know her um, and could speak more about her practice. So I think that's really important is um, interviewing um, individuals who, you know, have the lived experience or know, you know, um, uh, the histories um, so I saw in the comments that, that someone said, you know, Mine was a good friend of my mother's. And, you know, I've, I've been hearing from different people just sort of anecdotally little bits about um, who Mine Okubo was, her personality, and a little bit more about her artistic practice. And um, it's, it's really interesting because, you know, that information isn't found, um, you know, in, in secondary sources or primary sources either. So it, it's good to, to be able to collect those types of anecdotes um, and memories and, and stories about people. So I think that is very central to what we do here at the museum um, for all of our projects in, in our collections as well. We try to document um, as best we can using different types of, of sources, including 
you know, oral histories. Thank you, Kristen. Um, Emily Anderson has a question for both of you. She wants to know what are your favorite sketches by Mine? And also, what are your favorite finished illustrations? You want me to go first? <laughs> um, okay, there are, again, there are hundreds of sketches um, in the collection that Mineo Kubo created while she was incarcerated at Tanfren and Topaz. And we went through, um, you know, all of them, especially Rose Keiko definitely went through all of them and it's hard to pick, but there was one day I was, well, there were two things. One, um, that illustration, we call it a character study. I don't know if that's what Mineo would call it, but of the incarcerated stuffing mattresses. I just think it's so fun, even though it's such a laborious and, and mundane task. Like the way that she just illustrated these incarcerees, like, you know, figuring out ways to carry this really cumbersome mattress, I think was, you know, I don't know, it was just captivating. And then to see that some of those sketches were um, in the final illustrations was really incredible. So that was one. But there was this one sketch of an Issei man, and it was a very quick sketch of him, but it was the details that she put at the bottom. She put a time, it was like, you know, 1.23 in the afternoon. And she had, I think the date and also an, what I think is a barracks address. And there was something about that quick sketch that made me feel like I was in that room while she sketched it. Um, I had this kind of reaction to it. So those are my two favorite sketches. And then I, I talked about my favorite illustration. You're not supposed to have a favorite, but I really do. And it's that welcome to Topaz um, illustration because I think that the irony is just comes through. Um, it's so apparent, you know, again, like you have this welcoming band and they signed that say welcome to Topaz, but again, how could such an inhospitable climate or environment be welcoming? So I think that really shows what I, I believe um, Mineo Kubo's intention was for the book is to show the irony um, through very accessible um, and relatable illustrations. Oh gosh, Kristen, you really, you talked about some of the really great, <laughs> the great ones there. Uh, since so much of my outside of the exhibition work was spent looking at the rest of the Okubo collection, I think a lot of my favorite sketches and final paintings and illustrations are some of Mine's post-war work. Um, there are some really beautiful sketches that she has, that she made during camp. Um, we, have, we do have one in the exhibition of parents who have put their children in these big sinks that are used for laundry and they're bathing them. And that's a, you know, that's, that's not a experience that's isolated to being incarcerated, but to think that she would have sat in this laundry room and watching people go through every day and experience their lives to do the laundry, but also to make the most of it. She also has a couple of them with grown, fully grown people popping themselves in these huge sinks to take a bath um, because, you know, it, it, a big part of being Japanese American is bath culture and not having access to an ofudo, I'm sure was a very big inconvenience for a lot of people who are missing missing that. But um, in her post-war work, there's so much color and joy that is not really always present in some of these illustrations from camp. I think she does a good job of giving a really comprehensive view of what camp was like. But I think that her post-war work uh, hopefully in the future will be showcased or at least on the Janum website because some of it is really, it's different. And I think it's worth, worth seeing. Thank you. Um, I, you know, I, re I really feel like the example that Kristen had mentioned really does, you know, was very successful in communicating this ideal of the irony and the pathos, sort of the humor that you know what was happening was awful you know these people were stuffing their beds but in that moment you know they would wrap the thing around their head and you know i think she was just seeing the the ridiculous event that was occurring in front of her and sketching it 
and capturing sort of the oddity of this whole thing, this what was happening to them. Um, and so I think that in those sketches, it conveys that feeling really well, um, the sort of the tragedy, but also in that weird moment, this kind of odd, you know, how they were trying to carry these huge bags with hay, you know, to back to their barracks. So, so ironic. Um, so, okay, there's a lot of questions now. So um, Dexter has a question about, um, you know, he, he appreciates all the research you did and everything, but he wants to know what surprised you the most about what she was communicating. <laughs> Kristen? That is such a good question. And I've been, I saw it and I've been thinking about <laughs> how to answer this. Ah, uh, um, you know, I think what's so amazing is like, you know, I, I've, I've been studying the World War II incarceration experience for, you know, a number of years. And um, I, to be honest, I had not read Citizen 13660 um, prior to last year. I knew about it, but never really thought to look at it. And when you read it, it's like so much about what we know about the incarceration experience was written in this, in the captions or expressed in the illustrations in 1946, when, again, this was still a current event. It wasn't even recent history yet. And if we had just started there, like it's, it is all right there, um, which I think is, is maybe surprising. We just had to go to Mineo Kubo's Citizen 13660 to get a very candid um, and, and uh, comprehensive overview of what daily life was like um, in camp. So um, surprisingly, that is surprising. That was surprising to me. Um, I think the other thing too is um, just the way that she talks about how um, heterogeneous the, the community was. I think there's a tendency to think that the Japanese American community was so tight knit and it was very you know, homogeneous, but she, she alludes to differences generation, um, generation, generationally, I guess, between Issei and Nisei. Um, she definitely has her opinion or she, she often like sticks her tongue out at you know, the Issei men and doesn't really understand like their way of thinking. Um, when she first gets to, I think it's Topaz, she's supposed to be um, living with, in this block with a lot of Issei bachelors and she and her brother asked to be moved because they don't feel a connection. They feel very different from these Issei bachelors. Um, so I thought, you know, that was sort of interesting um, as well. So those are just a couple of things. Um, that's a great question, Dexter, thank you. Uh, it's, I think a great part of this collection, especially, I, Kristen is right, that Mine really does show, you know, there's, there's this really amazing story that she's telling with all of these details. And I ex I read this in school in LAUSD, what Citizen 13660 is required reading, I think it still is. Um, but going and getting to see this collection, there's edits edits to this to the text to the manuscript you can see this process because Kristen did touch on this that it was published in 1946 when there was still a camp that was open and this wasn't anything that was old news it was history that was happening or it was a current event it was still ongoing people were in the process of relocating and so the way that Mine had to tell this story very clearly was monitored probably by herself and by other people. And you can see the process through these materials of you know what she what she might have wanted to say, what she might might have wanted to depict, and how that changed over this very short time period where she decided, I'm gonna write this book and then I'm gonna publish it and have it available to the public all of these decisions she had to make in such a short amount of time and they're all really really interesting you know one other thing too i guess is we've observed different styles a way that she sort of depicted um daily life like the illustrations in citizen 13660 are very different from these like quick sketches that she did which are very different from the charcoal sketches, which many of you have seen, they're, they're about 13 in Janum's collection, but those are much more abstract and I think definitely convey the trauma um, of the experience. And uh, so I think that's you know, also um, interesting to think about like how these different styles um, communicate, I think the experience in, in different ways. So um, 
that's what's in here. So there's a lot of good questions coming up. Um, one is again from David Fujioka. He wants to know, you know, how did she get all of these artwork, you know, that, that were drawn in camp and transport them cross country after leaving camp? Maybe you could talk a little bit about how she went to New York and all that stuff. Another really great question. <laughs> um, it, yes, again, these these sketches, like the paper, you know, is is paper. It's meant to be somewhat ephemeral, right? But um, it most of the sketches are so pristine, right? There are very few that have like creases, or there are very few that are dog-eared, or it's it is amazing that they are seventy-five plus years old, right? Um, yeah, how did she transport? you know, hundreds of these sketches with her to um, New York. I, I don't really have the answer to that, but um, she must have, or maybe they were shipped ahead. I don't know, that's possible too. Um, but what is really interesting, and this remains a mystery. So again, we keep calling them the original illustrations for Citizen 13660. Um, and uh, those are what we have framed in the exhibition and looking at them, the paper is incredibly white you don't really see um, uh, like impressions from a pen. They're they're really incredible, and so we're not sure if like if these are like the illustrations that were used to make the book, or if they are like a cop not a copy, but you know she did them originally, but a later iteration. We're not sure, but I think there still are some questions in terms of um, timeline. Um, and uh, again, we don't know exactly how she did transport all this amazing artwork with her uh, to New York, but you're right, they're in incredible con condition. Um, David has a follow-up to that as well. She, he wants to know that during her time in, you know, were all the sketches completed in camp? or were some of them created after leaving camp? And I think, again, this is connected to the city. It's very similar to what your research has been finding. Right, so we, we, we thought, okay, all these sketches she definitely did in camp at Topaz and Tanfram because that issue of track, that artist profile, um, she talks about these sketches that she was doing. We have photographs of her sketching. Um, we know she was sketching nonstop while she was in camp. We thought that once she got to New York, that's when she started to take a lot of those um, quick sketches that she did from camp and use those as inspiration for the drawings. But then we also realized from reading um, the Fortune April 1944 issue um, is what, I mean, Fortune hired Minet to do some um, artwork for that issue of the magazine. And that's, you know, she went to New York um, because Fortune was sponsoring her. And um, there's a, a note, there's an article in the Fortune magazine that talks about how Mineo Kubo came to New York with 235 illustrations um, and that she was finishing or was thinking about a book. I mean, I can't remember exactly the language, but mentions this book. And there is an article called Ise Nise Kibe uh, in the issue, um, April 1944 issue of Fortune magazine uh, that talks about the Japanese American um, incarceration experience. It's very thorough and comprehensive, um, pretty amazing. Anyway, a lot of those illustrations that ended up in Citizen 13660 are in that um, issue, which means that she did the illustrations that ended up in Citizen 13660 while she was at Topaz. So again, so prolific. I don't think she ever slept. She was just producing constantly. Um, that being said, you know, it's possible that she definitely, uh, actually we know she, she was doing some sketches from memory because we do have a sketchbook that has sketches from the incarceration as well as like scenes from New York. So those were done when she was in New York. Okay, we're so honored to have author Ken Mochitsuki here. And, you know, he has a good author question <laughs> for you. Um, do you know if Minnie had to make any concessions demanded by the publisher to get Citizen published? And I think, I think Kristen has a good answer for that. Um, <laughs> the yeah, answer is we don't know <laughs> for sure. However, um, there are some, yeah, I think we, 
wonder about this. Like, uh, how candid was she um, with some of the captions? Um, is she, are those her true, is that her true perspective? Um, or is she really thinking about audience um, and maybe tailoring the captions, thinking about who the audience for this book might be? Um, I don't know. But in terms of like, was she required to make um, certain um, edits? I'm not really sure. Again, we do have a draft of the manuscript. And so we know that in most cases, the edits that were made to the text were pretty minor and I think meant to make the, the captions more succinct or readable. But there are a few cases, um, and we have those exhibited, where we felt that the draft manuscript text and the published text were different enough where it changed the meaning. There are some um, pages of the draft manuscript that have Minet's like edits, like her handwritten edits, and not all those made it in. But most of the time it didn't really change the meaning. But again, there were a couple where the, the published version sort of reads more like a WRA version of the Wakasa shooting incident, for example, or um, when it comes to dilemmas that incarcerees felt about leaving camp. I mean, I think that was sort of um, toned down too. So again, I don't know if who made those decisions on what the final text was, um, but it is interesting to observe those. <laughs> um, but there also is, um, so Okubo did submit um, an essay that was published in the San Francisco Chronicle and that was edited to include excerpts from one of Dylan Meyer's um, speeches. Uh, so that's a case where there were edits that made it sound very, you know, pro-American and, and WRA like, <laughs> I guess. Rose Keiko, did you have any observations? I think Christian covered a lot of it. I think there's maybe some speculation about what level of involvement the WRA had in Mine Okubo publishing Citizen One, Citizen One Three Six Six Zero, and we just will never know. Um, and you can look at it and look at this material from a lot of angles and also see some of these like floating edits some in those manuscript pages. Sometimes there are questions, but it's unclear who posed them and who is making the final say. And, you know, Mine Okubo was also, she was a smart woman and she also probably had to impose some concessions on her own work uh, because she knew the political climate. She knew who was going to be buying this book. Um, and so she had to, you know, there, there's a lot of her artwork that's really different than Citizen 1360. It's a totally different style. It's a different, and, you know, her personal correspondence is very different than the caption, the style of writing. Uh, and I think that's true for many people that their personal feelings are different from what they publish. But, um, it's hard to tell with all of those little things. I don't know if we'll ever find out, but it's interesting to look at it all and maybe make your own opinions. Thank you. Good answers. Um, there's here's a and and I think Ken in his other commentary captures it as well. He he understands everything you guys are saying because there are like you mentioned, Kristen, the introduction that you know, quotes Dylan Meyer. And so you know that the publisher has some input into that, what is being communicated. Um, there's a person, Ono Kao Kao, Ono Kao Kao, that sounds, makes me, making me hungry, it's dinner time, so. Um, and this is more of an artistic question. How does the style, how does Mini Okubo's style differ from Chura Obata, for example, um, since they were both at Topaz? I, know. I, I don't know enough about Obata's uh, work at Topaz to really make the comparison. But what is what I will say is interesting is I think that um, Okubo is definitely making a statement about camp um, in ways that cameras could not. And I think you definitely see that in um, one of the media pieces that's 
uh, in the exhibition um, that uh, Shani Waoka and Evan Kodani and Mae Kono created um, helped to make the, the, the static images more dynamic. Um, and um, what they've done is they've paired some of Mineo Kubo's drawings with home movie footage in our collection from Topaz. And I think what's so interesting is, you know, the some of the home movie footage from Topaz, people are waving because there's a camera around and that's what you do when there's a camera around. Um, and then, you know, next to that, juxtaposed with that, you see one of um, Okubo's sketches that depict the same sort of scene and it's a very different depiction. And um, so I, I do think that she is giving, Again, sometimes she uses humor. Sometimes um, they're all relatable and accessible, but if you look closely, you really see the complexity. Um, and sometimes it's very apparent, um, but uh, that's what I would say about Okubo's work. Comment, maybe you know more about Obata and you can comment. Yeah. Or Rose Keiko or? Yeah. Well, from, I mean, I have not spent a lot of time with the Obata collection, but from what I've seen of his artwork of from camp, you know, I think a lot of what I've seen the most is, you know, his most famous works are landscape pieces and he does a, you know, it, his work is very beautiful, um, even in these really harsh climates. I mean, Topaz was kind of like a wasteland. Um, and he has this really great painting of the super fiery sunset, you know, happening over this really flat land. Um, but I have also seen sketches, uh, especially one where he he's sketching this Wakasa shooting that's happened, and he has a little note on the bottom, and it's you know it's emotional. The sketch is emotional. It's very quick, but documenting. And so, not having really seen this full collection or not knowing the extent of the collection. I think it's probably really true that there were a lot of artists who had the work that they felt like they wanted to produce, you know, to, for their sanity, for their hobbies, to create something beautiful in a place that was not beautiful or that didn't feel like home anymore. But um, without having this, ability to look at every single little thing because Mineo Kubo saved everything for us, which is a real gift. But uh, I'll, I'll never know if Chiaura Obata had uh, all of these sketches if he documented the everyday life as well, because he might have, especially, you know, so you see that little snippet of the Wakasa and you think, okay, well, that's something that stuck with him. And I'm sure there was a lot more. Doesn't everybody want to be a curator out there? <laughs> These are such a great, I mean, I, I appreciate so much the depth of thought that, you know, every that goes into every move that they make for this exhibition, the kind of care and consideration. I, I would agree, you know, that Chuda was a Issei, so he had a much different perspective on life at that time than Mine, who was still in her 20s and who had gone through a complete Western education, you know, learning, graduated from Cal, um, went to Europe to study art. And so, you know, their perspectives and experiences, I think, were much different. And so, you know, at before um, Mine went to camp, she was wor working literally under Diego Rivera, who was painting frescoes on a ceiling while she was demonstrating, you know, how to do that technique for, for visitors walking by. So just their influences. But like Rose Keiko said, you know, the Wakasa shootings, physically impacted them to the point where they had to document this experience in whatever way they knew how to. And, um, I think the only thing I would say about Obata is that he did use a lot of symbolism in his work, in spite of being a, more of a traditionalist, that as we look at and appreciate his work too, I think he was saying things, maybe not as literally as Mine was, but saying them nonetheless. So. Yeah, so, um, okay, here's, here's a question for, for um, Rose Keiko. Um, we know that your auntie was um, um, Karen Higa, and, you know, in many of our eyes, Karen Higa was, you know, she's very high on the pantheon of curators. So how, how did that feel for you coming into this opportunity here at the museum? And I don't know, how did it make you feel? 
Well, it's there, you know, there are big shoes and I did not step into this role assuming that I would ever fill them. Um, but there is something very similar to like a homecoming about working at Janum, especially in my first day when I was greeted with my desk that had a large picture of Karen Higa when I think taken at 26 or 27. Um, and so I don't know. There, I think that I, she gave me a real gift of early life art appreciation and museum education from the get-go. And that was all at Janum. And uh, this experience, especially working with Kristen as a mentor and as a role model, I there's a lot that can happen when you're 21 and you're figuring out your career and your education. But if I ended up as a curator, then wouldn't that be a dream? <laughs> I think I would be pretty uh, pretty satisfied if that became my career. If I could do, if I could create an exhibition like Kristen has created and like everyone at Janum has been able to, you know, work with, I would be very, very pleased. <laughs> we'll see. Okay. Good answer. Um, David Fujioka is asking the same thing. If, if that, if you will be a museum curator in the future. And I think you, I think you answered that. <laughs> Um, so we're, we're getting close to the end here, but, um, I think I'd like to ask one final question. Well, I guess David has a question. If anyone knows, um, does, did all the camps have at least one prominent artist documenting everyday life? And he, he meant, uh, Estelle Ishigo for Heart Mountain. I think... I mean, I would have to think about that for a while, but... Kristen, do you know? Yeah, I was trying to think about that too. Uh, although, yeah, I mean, we we have like the Henry Sugimoto collection. He was at Roar. He was at Jerome. Jerome. <laughs> um, and then like Jack Murrow from Amachi. And I'm just thinking about our collections at Janum. But, um, you know, thinking about Minidoka, I'm trying to think of an artist that comes to mind from our collections there. But, um, that is a very good question. Minidoka had Kenji Donomura. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And Poston was really interesting too. There were a lot of um, like animators who were like teaching classes there and influenced a lot of artists there. But that's a good question we need to explore further. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sure there's more than one for for every camp it's mostly about you finding them because when you say heart mountain i think benji okubo that's right um, but yeah i'm i, I imagine i mean mini okubo did she she figured it out for herself but being incarcerated that you know she was abroad she was you know living her life as a in her late 20s early 30s she was an artist she had all of this stuff that she was doing she had to stop doing it for you know years to go and sit in utah um so i'm, I'm sure that there are a lot and even her mother who's a, you know who was an isa who didn't wasn't incarcerated she passed away, but she was an artist she her her life got complicated so i'm sure if you look uh, there are archives full of notable artwork that you just have to find it all of these people all of the papers john tomai also points out isamu noguchi <laughs> posted albeit very short um so i, I just want to close with one last question for both of you and you know you you two have become so immersed in all of mine's thoughts and her creations if you could ask Mimi and Kubo one question, what would you ask her? Rose Keiko. Oh no. Um, oh my gosh. That's a really hard question, Clement. Hmm. 
I think I would have to ask her what her driving force was to create artwork post incarceration. Her, I mean, I think that it was a part of her being about who she was. She needed to create all this artwork. She also needed to save it all in her apartment. Um, but I would love to know about her influences and what drove her to create these, you know, thousands of paintings afterwards every day and to sometimes live without electricity or heat to do this. One one question so hard. Like I want to know where she where the accent over the e <laughs> came from. Um, but I guess more, more seriously, I, I would want to know where the courage and audacity came from to publish um, this memoir. I mean, to be a Japanese American woman in New York in 1944, 46, like couldn't have been easy, and it must have taken, you know, again, a lot of courage and audacity. So where did she get the strength to do that? And then how did she, um, how did she react to these reviews about um, the work? And, and when people said, oh, she uses humor, there's no bitterness, or she's so objective, we wanted more emotion. Like, you know, what would she say to that? Because we don't see that at all. <laughs> um, so I would have lots of questions for her. <laughs> Okay. All right. So we're at that. We're past the hour now. And so I just want to thank my two guests for the, the two stars of the show, Kristen Ayashi and Rose Keiko Higa. Um, again, want to thank um, all, all the people who came to listen and chat with us. Um, and I want to thank again, uh, Kimiko Mar and the Japanese American Memorial Pilgrimages. So please share this video. It'll be on their website. Share it with all your friends. Post it on your Facebook page or your Instagram. And we look forward to many more programs coming up as part of the Japanese American Memorial Pilgrimage program, Tadaima. So, okay, thank you. Thank you.